this morning in John chapter number 20. Let's start reading at verse number 24. We're going to read about Thomas this morning. It says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Now remember, this is the time after when Jesus had come and appeared to them already. Thomas uh, missed church, so to speak. And uh, here Thomas was not with them when Jesus came the first time. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. This is after his resurrection. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hand the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now we're going to get into that just for a minute in, in a second, but let's keep reading. Verse 26, And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Pay close attention to this next phrase. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas hears of Jesus appearing from the other disciples. And Thomas says what many, what I would call God-haters, would say today, I will not believe until you give me some hard evidence, until you can give me something to put my hand on. I want to be able to touch a nail print in his hand. I want to be able to put my finger in his side. And here's the thing that we must realize, that is a very dangerous game to play. Thomas had the opportunity to literally see Jesus before he died. The God-haters of the world today, when they say these, the, the atheists, the agnostics, these that say there is no God, I will not believe in Him until I see Him face to face. When they see Him, it will be eternally too late. But today we're going to begin our journey toward Easter where Jesus addresses Thomas and his doubts about His resurrection. It is only when Thomas sees Him literally when he sees the nail prints in his hands and in his feet and the pure side that he had, that he truly believed that Jesus has resurrected. He can literally see Jesus after his resurrection at that time. However, as I've already said, those who say, I will not believe until I see him, it will be too late. Because salvation is only offered in this life. Once you pass from this life and you stand before God, your decision is final. And so we see that it is very important that we take a close look at Easter and what all it means and what led up to this wonderful event that we're going to be celebrating in the next few weeks. Today, I trust that we're going to draw strength from the fact that God loves us and that He has everything under control. Now, if I were to go around and I were to ask you, I uh, asked this one man I was talking to the other day uh, that I told you about, and he said, what does the cross have to do with Easter? When did Easter begin? Maybe some would say when Jesus rose from the dead. That was when Easter began. Or maybe they would say uh, the Christians, I've heard some say that the Christians first took this pagan holiday Easter, which it was, and it turned it into a Christian into a Christian holiday, so I started celebrating the resurrection of Christ, and that is when Easter began. And some would say the resurrection is when Easter began. And some would say the cross is when Easter began. Because if there were no cross, there would be no resurrection. If there were no resurrection, there would be no Easter. However, in this series, I want to challenge us over the next few weeks that we're going to see that Easter actually began much earlier than many people think. We're going to start at the very beginning. But before we get there, there's a few things that we need to understand. It is a must that we understand these things. Number one, we need to understand that God 
is a planner. Okay? He is not somebody who I tend to be this way, throw things together at the last minute. It's like, hey, let's do something. This is coming. Hey, hey, let's get together and we'll figure something out when you get here. Jesus is not that way. God is not that way. He is a planner. And he is a planner like no other planner. Sometimes you go to these places and these big businesses, they have, you walk in and I've heard of them having their big five-year plan towards success. And some of them even have 10-year plans and even 20-year plans and so forth and so on. And they plan out all these different things for what they're going to do. But God is even more of a planner than that. Because God made His plans before the world even began. Before the world was formed, God had His plans laid out. I think of Jeremiah chapter number 29 and verse number 11, where Jesus or God speaks, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected what? End. He knows where you're going to be. His thoughts towards you are already there. The psalmist tells us that his thoughts towards us are more than can be numbered. He is a planner like no other planner. Isaiah chapter number 46. Turn into your Bibles to Isaiah 46. Let's take a look at a couple of verses. Verses 9 and 10. You see, I think that we tend to believe, we, we say we believe that God knows everything. That he has complete foreknowledge and all these different things. But yet when we live our lives, we act like that God may have made a little bit of a mistake in his foreknowledge. He may have made a little bit of a mistake here. There may be something a little bit wrong there. Maybe he planned it out differently uh, for this or for that. But I want you to see that God does not wait until we're young people or until we're born or until uh, we're teenagers to begin planning our lives. But let's take a look here that he makes our plans before the world began. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, he says, and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Pay close attention to this next phrase. Declaring the what? End from the beginning. Now that's interesting that he can declare the end when he's at the beginning. Because he knows everything that's going to take place. He can tell you the end all the way backwards to the beginning. He knows all things that will take place. He says, continuing on, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. He knows them. He has them planned. He knows what will happen. Not one time did Jesus or God go, oh, I missed that part. He already knows what's going to happen. That's why the book of Revelation is in the Bible. That's why we can say with the confidence that the world will be destroyed with a fervent heat. The book of Peter tells us that. Because God can tell us the end all the way back to the beginning. And he doesn't miss one single thing. He says, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God is a God like no other God. He is a planner like no other planner. He has made plans that have been laid out before the world began. Do you realize that God planned you and me before we were even conceived? Psalm chapter 139, take your Bibles and turn there. We think, well, God's a great planner. He's a great God, and what a wonderful God He is. But sometimes I think, honestly, we as Christians don't give Him enough credit. We think, man, look at what I've done. Look at this, look at that. We forget that God already had it planned out for this. Let's take a look here. Psalm chapter 139. It was no surprise when you were born to God. Sometimes there may have been a surprise to the parents. But there was no surprise to God. He knew. He knew. Psalm 139 verse 14. I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. 
And that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes, watch closely, did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members, that is, my hands, my fingers, my limbs, my feet, my legs, my head, my eyes, my ears, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. God knew what you would look like before you were born. God knew when you would be born. God had a plan for your life before you were born. God has a plan for my life. He had a plan for me before I was born. He has a plan for your life before you were born. He had it laid out. It says, if you follow my plan, this is what will happen. But... If you don't follow my plan, here's what's going to happen. You say, well, I'll choose not to follow God. He still knows what's going to happen. I, I like these things I watched on YouTube. These people who try to prove that God doesn't know everything. And one of my favorite ones is the drink of water. Y'all ever seen one of these? There you go. How does God know what I'm thinking? I'm going to drink of water. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Well, well yeah, I am. How did God know I was going to do that? <laughs> well, how do they know God didn't know that they were going to do that to begin with? They never fooled God. It, that's a silly thing. Well, uh, God knew from the beginning that you were going to try to trick Him. You didn't fool Him one bit. God didn't go, oh, He took a drink of water. Man, I can't believe I missed that one. He knew what was going to happen. He knows everything about us. The Bible tells us that even the number of our hair is numbered on our heads. He knows every detail about us. Take your Bibles over to Jeremiah. You need to see this. Jeremiah chapter number 1. We say, well, I'll just make my own path. Well, you can. But God will tell you that if you do that, there will be destruction at the end. I believe this. So that there's no question. I believe that God has foreknowledge and there is predestination taught in the Bible. I believe that man has free will to choose. But God still knows what will happen if you choose this direction or if you choose that direction. Please understand, when I talk about the sovereignty of God, He is sovereign. We don't fool God by our choices we make. He knows what we'll make, and He knows what will happen when we make those choices. But we still get to make those choices. For example, if I know that there's a $10 bill right here, and I tell Corbin, don't get that $10 bill, but I know that he really, really wants it. He has a choice. I can either take it or not take it. There's a $10 bill right here. And or he cannot take it, maybe I'll go do something else with them. Or he can take it and say, don't touch it. Knowing Corbin, I know what he's going to do. You do too. If there were a $1,000 bill sitting right there, and I said, don't touch this $1,000 bill, don't touch it. I wonder, hmm, what would happen? I know it's going to take place, don't you? I, I already have foreknowledge. It's already predetermined he's going to take it because it's there. Right? All right. Thank you. <laughs> Work with me here. I know he's going to take it. And yet, does he have a choice? Yes. Even though I know he's going to do it. Starting to predetermine he's going to do it, he still can choose to take it or not. You following me? All right, that's kind of a deep subject. We'll get into it later. Let's keep taking a look here that God has a specific plan for our lives. Jeremiah chapter number one, you're there with me. I want you to understand this plan was not created at our birth. God didn't go, oh, what a pretty little, precious little girl that Hazel is. Let's see, what can I do for her? Let me start planning out her life now. He didn't do that. He doesn't go, oh, oh you're, you're eight years old? Let's see, let's start figuring out what we're going to do for our teenage years. What are you going to do then? He doesn't do that. 
Because you go, okay, look, you're, you're 30 years old now. Let's see what you can do. Let's see, how can I plan your 40s and your 50s? Or how can I plan your 70s or your 80s or your 90s? Or how can I plan? He doesn't do that. Jeremiah shows us plainly. Jeremiah chapter number 1, verses 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Watch. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Jeremiah said, Before I was even born, God had ordained me to be a prophet before the nations. Do you realize that before I was ever born, God had ordained me to be pastor of Old Grove Baptist Church? Before you were born, God had ordained you to be whatever God has called you to be. But now here's the thing. You can either choose to follow God's plan for your life, or you can choose to neglect God's plan for your life. And I wonder this morning, if we are following the plans that He has laid out for us, or if we are kicking against the pricks, as Paul says. We're kicking against those pricks of the Holy Spirit's leading. God has a plan laid out for us. A specific plan. I believe that God deals with specifics. You say, how do you know that? Have you read through the Old Testament with all the chronological orders that takes place? Those big, long things that, uh, that happen later, love those things. What are they? The, uh, uh, I say chronological, but the history and the begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so. There's like half the Bible almost, it seems like it's full of them. He is a God of detail. He doesn't go, well, someday you can maybe be, I don't know, let's just some type of a business. If he calls you to business, he's going to call you to do Krispy Kreme donut business in such and such town, in such and such place, in such and such street, and that's where you're supposed to be. He's a God of detail. He has your plan ready for you. Here's the thing. If you follow God, your life won't be a bed of roses. It'll still be difficult, but you won't have to worry because God has got it under control. He's already got it laid out for you. But I want us to say not only is He a planner like no other planner, but God is a God like no other God. Now, I like this point. I want us to see in Psalm chapter 115 that God is more powerful than any other God. Little g. You say, are there other gods? There are false gods. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in brief in a moment. But God is more powerful than any other little g-o-d. Psalm 115 starting at verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord... Not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, beautiful things. But he says, The work of men's hands. He explains them in verse 5. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throats. <laughs> he gets very clear with them in verse 8. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. What kind of God do you serve if you have to make your God? What kind of God do you serve if you say, Well, my little idol right here, I'll tell you what, here's my hard times. And I'm having a struggle with this. What do you think I should do? And nothing happens. You say, Well, I don't have an idol. What about that little car sitting out in our driveway? Well, Bessie, I'll tell you what. I'm having a rough time with this. What are we going to do? What about that house or that boat or whatever it is? You say, what is a God? Let me make this very clear. A God is anything or anyone that you place above God Almighty. That becomes your God. 
He is like no other God. Turn over to Isaiah once again in verse 40. I want you to see this. In verse number 12. Isaiah 40 starting at verse number 12. God shows us in his word how great he is. That there is none like him. Isaiah chapter number 40. In verse number 12. He says, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hands, and meted out the heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in balances? Who has done that? No one. No man has ever done that. No man could ever esteem to do that. But only God Almighty could. Why? He created the sand. He created the hills. He made the mountains. He measured out the ocean and told it when to stop. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord? Or being his counselor hath taught him? No man could teach God. No man. God didn't go to a counselor. He didn't go to his eternal psychologist and say, what do you think I should do? No counselor was there. God is the counselor. With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him? And taught him in the path of judgment? And taught him knowledge? And showed to him the way of understanding? No one did that. God teaches us. He didn't need anybody else. He is a self-existing, self-sustaining, almighty God. Behold, the nations, they are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn. The cedars of Lebanon were the most beautiful trees on planet earth at that time. That's why Solomon went to the cedars of Lebanon to have the temple built. They were the most beautiful, the most precious of woods. And he says, they're not even worthy to be burnt for me. And he says, nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. We look around today at all the political system and all the things taking place. We go, well, this nation's doing that. This nation's doing that. Korea's uh, uh, now trying to threaten to nuke us and they're trying to do this over here. You got the G27 happening. You got such and such thing. God says, they're nothing compared to me. They're nothing compared to me. And they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Verse 18, to whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? We say, we say, well, what can we make in the form of God? You can't. There's no likeness to make God. You can't put God in an image. You can't put God uh, in a box. That's why Jesus came. By the way, do you realize that Jesus blew everybody's box that they had about God? That's why he healed on the Sabbath day. That's why he did it. That's why he walked on the waters. He, he did everything from, from uh, making all the religious people upset to defying nature itself. He defied all things that men thought that God would be. You can't put him in a box or an image. The workman melted the graven image, and the goldsmith spread it over with gold and cast his silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he has no oblation chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? From the very beginning of time, it's been declared through God and his people. Have you not heard? Don't you know? Now, this next verse, there are people out there who will try to disparage the Bible. And they'll say, well, that's just a man-written book about from these people who thought the earth was uh, still flat. And they say, there's nothing to the Bible. It was written by these ancient people. Well, 
They're forgetting that man may have penned it, but God wrote it. Pay close attention to this next verse. It is he that sitteth upon the... Uh-oh. It's not a flat earth. The circle. Hmm, I wonder what that means. The circle of the earth. Do you think that in the book of Isaiah, God knew that the earth was round? Of course he did. He made it. That's a good verse to point out to them. Now, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. That stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. That bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity, speaking of what God does. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stalk shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal? Saith the Holy One. He is above any other God that this world tries to place before us. But I want you to notice that he loves like no other God. See, these false gods, they demand sacrifice of their followers for their own salvation. The book of Leviticus talks about this God called Molech. Molech in Leviticus 18.21, the children of Israel were specifically uh, commanded by God not to let any of thy seed pass through the fire of Molech. Then there shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. You see, those in that time who worshipped this false god Molech would literally take their babies and would throw them in the fire while they were alive to appease their God so they could have an afterlife. What kind of God is that? Well, we don't have Molech today. No, but we have Islam. Oh, Brother Caleb, be careful. Be careful. Well, let's just be honest. Islam requires jihad. They have the holy war, the suicide bombers, all these other terrorist things that take place. Why do they do that? Because they are promised that they would be the greatest in the afterlife. They are guaranteed their place in their heaven if they go and they do this jihad. So for them to be great in their afterlife, they must go and give their own life for their God. What kind of God is that? Well, I don't serve Molech. I don't serve Islam. What about materialism? Materialism is wanting more, more, more things, uh, ideas, and wanting these different, uh, maybe it's a different level of people knowing who you are, more popularity. Maybe it's more things, acquiring more riches or more wealth. Maybe it's acquiring more time of others. Materialism. It demands time, effort, and many times the sacrifice of families. How many families have fallen apart so that they can just have another buck? So they can just get a little more well known in the community. So they can just do a little bit better in this and that, and their families are falling apart. They sacrifice happiness. How many times have you heard of rich men on their deathbed and they still were not happy? I believe it was Rockefeller. They said, how much will be enough? He said, just one more dollar. Just one more dollar. And you look at all these popular, well-known people that's over in Hollywood. Divorces everywhere. Life splattered all over the media. All the millions of dollars that they could ever want. And they're still committing suicide. They're still hating their own lives. Amen. There's no happiness in materialism. Amen. And yet so many Christians are even following after that. And I just have a little bit more. We sacrifice our contentment. Not to mention a personal walk with Christ. Mark 8, 36, Jesus says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? That's materialism. And lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give exchange for his soul? You see, these are awful things. But let me finish with God, the God I serve, Jehovah, who instead of requiring me to sacrifice my children, 
Instead of requiring me to sacrifice myself for my eternal life, for my place in this quote-unquote afterlife of theirs, he sacrificed his son for me. That's the difference. John 3, verses 14 through 17. And Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man, Jesus says, be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, God is a planner like no other planner. And if we follow after him and his plan laid out for our lives, everything won't be perfect in our life, but everything will be all right in the end. You've got God's personal guarantee on that. He is a God like no other God. Don't get distracted by these false gods and ideas that people try to throw our way constantly around. Stay focused on God Almighty. And you will see that He is a wonderful, loving God. And tell others of the wonderful love that God has for us. Bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Nobody's looking around. We've talked about our God. What a great God He is. He is not a spur of the moment God. He is a God that has everything planned for you right now. Had it planned for you before you were even born. He knew that you would be right here where you are today. He knew that you'd be hearing this this morning. There's a reason for that. I wonder if we're sharing God's love with others. I wonder if we're showing God's love more than just in speech, but in our action and in our attitudes. Let's all stand this morning. Maybe we want to come forward and pray for someone. Maybe we can come forward and say, God, help me to show forth your love this Easter season. Lord, help me to share your love. Maybe you're lost. You need to experience God's love. The hymn says the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned. From a sin. Could be with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, those dredged from sky to sky. And that chorus says, O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It is forevermore endure the saints and angels song. The love of God. The altars are open this morning to come forward. As the holy play, we won't sing this morning. We're going to simply stand in contemplation. Come forward and move this morning. The altars are open. Let's do business with God as we think about the love of God this morning.
find you. Let me encourage you. If you know somebody who is lost, pull them by the ears to church these next few Sundays. They will hear the gospel Sunday mornings. Bring them to church this month and let them hear the plain gospel preached and proclaimed.